don't, I don't believe in God can do healing, no. I don't believe in miracles like that. I believe more in the placebo effect. I think you heal yourself. Uh, that water can be turned into wine? Probably not. I wish it did. Um, that would be interesting. There's loads of different things I can class as a miracle. To so some person will say that's luck. I believe. I believe in science. I'm quite a lucky person, so I like to think that's something to do with God anyway. Listen, there's miracles every day. Like my, my, my kids are all healthy. Somebody recovering from an illness which they were destined to die from and not given any chance of survival. I suffered from alopecia and my hair was not meant to grow back at all. I guess you class that as a miracle then. I've witnessed a miracle. For a medical person to tell you that your hair's not going to grow back and your hair grows back, then... I believe in things that I see that are real. But I'd be interested if somebody could show me. The question of tonight's talk is, does God heal today? And that's a question I've actually struggled with at a number of points in my life. Uh, when I was, I was born and bred uh, in a beautiful picturesque town called Luton, just north of London. And, uh, but before I was born, my parents had actually been missionaries in Taiwan. And while they were out there, my uh, mum uh, became pregnant. And she then, a few months later, suddenly went into labour and they were in the capital city, Taipei. And it's quite difficult getting across uh, Taipei on any day of the year. They didn't have a car, they had to hail a taxi, but this was the 30th of January, Chinese New Year. And so they kind of came out of the apartment, they desperately tried to hail a cab, they finally got one, they jumped in. Uh, my mum was getting more and more into advanced stage of labor, and then they suddenly hit this huge traffic jam, because if you've ever been in a Chinese culture on Chinese New Year, that's when people really go out to party. And so just everyone was out on the streets, and they, they, the car wasn't moving. And my Dad kind of started to suss up the success of the situation. He started to think, this could go really badly wrong. My wife could give birth to a baby in the back of a cab on Chinese New Year in Taipei. This is not how I thought this day was going to go. And, uh, and then before he knew it, my mum was actually giving birth on the back seat of a cab taxi in, in, in Taipei. And the taxi driver was kind of looking over his shoulder, just kind of checking his seats are OK. And my dad had to adopt the brace position in the footwell and then actually catch this baby as it kind of popped out, as they do. And, uh, <laughs> but if you've been in a Chinese culture, you'll know that Chinese New Year is considered the luckiest day of the year. Births, by their very nature, are considered very lucky. But to have a baby born in your place of work on Chinese New Year, that's like having the winning lottery ticket right there in your hand. And so the taxi driver, his reaction to all of this was to jump out of his taxi and just start running around the cab, throwing money in his I mean, he doesn't need money anymore. He's got a baby in his cab on Chinese New Year. He's set for life. And, and then he starts kind of, he's so overjoyed, he's going up to all the other cars in the in the taxi jam and saying, look, come, come see, it's so exciting, you'll never believe what's happened. And so all these other people are getting out of their cars and kind of coming over, waving, hi, how are you doing? My mum's like this, my dad's like this. And uh, eventually my dad manages to, to kind of coax him back and say, look, can we go to hospital? It's actually quite serious. And um, it's quite funny now, but at the time it was actually quite traumatic. And when they arrived at hospital, uh, the doctors said, one of the things they said um, when my mum had recovered and uh, uh, the baby, who was my sister, Susanna, had, uh, had, was okay, they said, look, you just need to know, because of this traumatic birth, I'm afraid to say you're, you're not going to be able to have any more children. And my mum was absolutely devastated. Uh, she'd always wanted to have loads of children, and she just couldn't believe that this had happened. But she was also in a community of people who prayed and who believed that God could do anything, actually. And then, two years later, actually contrary to that medical assessment, she had another baby. And then seven years later, she had another baby. Uh, and that baby was me. On balance, I quite like being alive, so I'm very, very happy that happened. Uh, and, and actually... Uh, a few years later, she had another one too, my little brother Paul. Actually, at the time when they were trying quite hard not to have a baby, uh, but we don't really talk about that because he's a little bit sensitive about it. Uh, but <laughs> I don't want to sound ungrateful. I really love being alive. But in spite of all that happening, I've always been pretty skeptical about the whole idea of God healing today. The idea of healing or miracles. The idea that God would from time to time miraculously intervene in some way. It, it, just, it just seemed a bit unlikely and it seemed a bit arbitrary. Why this person? Why not that person? 
And on top of all that, I studied as a lawyer and then worked as a, a criminal defense barrister uh, for seven years. And in that world, you become really good at testing evidence and inference. That's what you're doing every day. Show me the evidence. I want to pick it apart. I want to see what evidence there is. And you're always looking for alternative explanations. So let me give you a, a completely ridiculous example. Imagine that you're driving home from Alpha tonight and the police pull you over and they do a search of your car and they find uh, in the boot of your car uh, a, a, a rucksack with 20 kilos of cocaine in it. Oh, been a nervous laughter. I hope that is a ridiculous um, <laughs> example. Uh, and, um, and, and there's a number of possible explanations for why there is 20 kilos of coke in your car. And actually, only one of them is that you're a drug importer. I mean, you, you might be as surprised as the police. I've, had, I've known a number of people who have tried that one. Uh, you, 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 I'm so surprised, officer. I didn't know that, that rucksack was there. Oh, it's what, I'm as surprised as you are. Astonishing. Um, I have no idea how it got in there. Or uh, 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 someone who you just started to trust in your alpha small group had said to you that evening, would you mind carrying home this rucksack for me? I just don't really want to take it on the tube. And you being a nice person said, of course, very happy to. And you, had no, you knew the bag was there, but you had no idea what was inside it. You know, a bit heavy, but uh, you, you didn't. You don't automatically think, oh, that person's a drunk person. So you, um, so, uh, and, the, and oh, boy, the other option is, of course, that um, you've got an extraordinary level of personal use and you're organised, you like to buy in bulk. And, uh, I mean, they're all possible explanations. I'm not saying they're all plausible or that a jury would believe any of them, but there's always other explanations. And so I spent every day for years trying to work out where the circumstances might have been viewed through the wrong lens, where from another perspective there could be an entirely rational explanation. So when I used to hear people saying, it's a miracle, my instinct was to kind of raise my eyebrows and question. I, I wasn't cynical. I, I think I allowed for the possibility, but I was not going to be easily convinced. But then I started to come across things which made me sceptical about my scepticism. I actually started to doubt my doubts. Events happened which forced me to look again at the whole area of healing. People I knew who were normal and who had conditions, illnesses, and who were sick and were prayed for, got better when they really shouldn't have. And were actually the most likely explanation was that God had healed someone. And I'm not the only one who's had to wrestle with that. Both Sandy Miller, the former vicar of this church, and Nicky Gumbel, uh, the vicar of this church, uh, were barristers and had a similar training. Actually, in 1982, uh, this church was visited by an American pastor from California called John Wimber, and he uh, he had been a rock musician, Righteous Brothers, in the 1960s. And he had had this encounter with Jesus and come to place his faith in Jesus. And he started reading the Bible, he read the New Testament, and he read about all this stuff, as he put it, that Jesus did, that the disciples did. He, going around, healings, miracles. And so he went along to church and he couldn't wait for them to start doing the stuff. But no one did the stuff. And so after a while, he thought, well, I'll become a pastor and I'll do the stuff. And actually, he came here um, in 1982 to talk about doing the stuff, to talk about healing. And he actually gave a talk on healing in a room downstairs called The Spring, which is downstairs just beneath me in the church. And people, people at the church were quite excited about this. They, they liked the idea of a talk on healing. And people smiled as he started his talk. And then after about 15 minutes, he stopped speaking about healing and said, now we're going to have a coffee break, and then we're going to come back and do some healing. I mean, people didn't talk about doing healing. So as you can imagine, it was the longest coffee break the world has ever seen. And then when people came back, those who'd been sitting in the front row thought maybe it'd be a little bit kind of selfish to sit in the front row. So they kind of made their way to the back. And <laughs> what he said was that exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit at the weekend and at the Alpha Day this Saturday, we look at the gifts of the Spirit. And he said, exercising the gifts of the Spirit, his team have been praying. And in that list, we look at in 1 Corinthians 12, one of the gifts is words of knowledge. And he said his team had had these words of knowledge. A supernatural revelation of things that were wrong with people, conditions people had, that they couldn't have known about naturally. They'd had impressions, pictures, sometimes sympathy paints. And he read out a whole list 12 of them. 
And then he said, I'm going to ask these people to come forward. And the first was a man who'd injured his back chopping wood when he was 14 years old. And remarkably, a guy got up and came forward and was prayed for. And then he talked about a number of different things. And each one, one by one, people responded. But there was one that no one had responded to. And there was someone, he said, there was someone who'd been trying to conceive and hadn't been able to. Now, this was uh, Kensington in the 1980s. And you might have noticed that in, in Britain, we can be a little bit of reserved sometimes, uh, British people. Um, you know, we don't really talk about things like conception in public. I'm sure in California, they talk about little else. But, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and it's quite difficult to get up and respond to a word like that. It's quite a brave thing, quite a bold thing to do to make yourself vulnerable. But after a while, he waited, and a young woman called Sarah Wright got up, and no one had any idea that she was trying to conceive, trying to have a baby. Uh, but she got up and the team prayed for her. And actually, nine months later, she gave birth to a little boy. Although I hasten to say conception didn't take place down there in the room. Um, but actually, since she's had five children. So what does the Bible actually say about healing? As I started to look at this book and see what it said, I was surprised. And what I saw, that it's actually in God's nature to heal. God loves you. He wants you to thrive. He wants you to experience wholeness in your life. And there's a verse in the Old Testament, Exodus 15, 26, which says this, I am the Lord who heals you. And the word Jesus actually means saviour. And the Greek word for save is sozo. And it's an interesting word, sozo, because it can mean I save. And of course, Jesus came to save us from our sins, to bring us forgiveness. But that same word also means I heal. And God is a God who loves to heal. Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. And today, God wants to heal. And he wants to use you and me to bring healing to those who are around us. And you're never more like God than when you're helping hurting people. Think what you can do with your life as you go around dispensing healing, uh, wiping away people's tears, healing the brokenhearted, lifting up those who have fallen, rescuing the broken, helping people overcome their addiction. And in this broken, hurting, and dividing world, being someone who brings healing. And there's this verse in uh, Proverbs 14, which talks about the tongue which brings healing. The fact that your words actually have great power, can have great power for good. With the tongue, you can bring healing to division. You can bring peace, encouragement, forgiveness. And I don't know about you, but I think that, in fact, uh, lots of the hurt that we experience in life comes through relationships. And actually, most of our healing comes through relationships as well. Relationships with each other and our relationship with God. But in the Bible, it's not just talking about emotional health, psychological health, spiritual health. It is all those things, but it's also talking about physical healing. And what I hadn't realized was that actually 25% uh, of the accounts of Jesus' life are taken up with the healing miracles of Jesus. It says Jesus had compassion on people. Uh, Matthew says this in Matthew 4, 23, that Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among people. But the thing is, it wasn't just Jesus. Jesus said to his followers, like you and me, he, said, he gave them authority, and he gives you authority. It's not just for special people who are healers. This is for every Christian. He gives authority to go and tell the good news and heal those who are sick. And that's what they did. And as you read the book of Acts, they went around healing people. And as you read church history all the way down the centuries, that's what you see. And still today, God is healing people. There was a, a lady who came one night here to Alpha and shared her story, Jean Smith. And she was a woman in her 60s uh, from Wales. And 16 and a half years before, she had gone blind. She'd had a disease in the retinas of both eyes. And it was inoperable. And the doctors told her that she would never see again. And she went, actually went totally blind. And she had a white stick. And she had a guide dog uh, called Tina. And she went on an Alpha course in Cumbran in Wales. She didn't really want to go because they were using DVDs. And she wouldn't thought, well, I won't be able to see the DVDs. So, uh, but she went anyway. And she went on the Alpha weekend, just like many of you have gone on, and like the Alpha day, which um, I know lots of you are going on to this Saturday. 
And on that Alpha weekend, she had an experience of the Holy Spirit. And she'd been in a lot of pain with her eyes. And the pain just went. And she said this. She said, I was so thankful to God that on the Sunday evening, I went to church. And I wanted to thank God for taking away the pain. And the minister came and he anointed me with oil as a sign of the healing that had taken place. And as I wiped away the oil like that, I could see the communion table in front of me. And she said, I went home that night and I saw my husband for the first time in 16 and a half years. She couldn't believe how white he'd gone, she said. Um, she had never seen her daughter-in-law. She'd never seen her six and a half year old grandson. Her six and a half year old grandson used to lead her around puddles. And when he saw that she could see, he said, well, who's done that, Gran? And she said, Jesus has made me better. And he said, did you thank him for it, Gran? She said, I've never stopped thanking him. But of course, not everybody is healed. I think of uh, a guy called Patrick. He's got total kidney failure. And he tried having a transplant. His mother gave him one of her kidneys. And that didn't work. And he's on dialysis. He's been on dialysis for 25 years. He passionately believes in healing. He's given this talk. He gives this talk in his local church. And people have prayed for him so much, but he hasn't been healed. But Patrick says, God has given me salvation and eternal life with all the peace, freedom, and joy that flow from that. I'd love him to heal me, but that would be a bonus. So when Jesus sent the disciples out, and when Jesus spoke, he spoke actually a lot about the kingdom of God. He said, go and heal people and tell them the kingdom of God is near. And the kingdom of God is, is like God's sphere of influence. When God's sphere of influence is total and complete, uh, as it will be one day, then there'll be no more sickness. So there's kind of a future aspect to the kingdom. One day Jesus will return, and there are 300 references in the New Testament to the return of Jesus. There'll be a new heaven, a new earth. There'll be no more cancer, no more suffering, no more pain. There'll be total healing for everyone. Patrick will be perfectly healed on that day. But right now, not everyone is healed. And the Apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, uh, we groan inwardly because our bodies are declining. He says, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. And the total redemption of our bodies will only happen in the future. So the kingdom of God has this future aspect. But Jesus says it also has a present aspect. And it's a little bit like today. I, I hope you've enjoyed the weather today. It's been amazing all over London. But we're still in March, but it feels like it's summer. And I don't know about you, but I was out at lunchtime, and you kind of look around, and people are kind of sunbathing outside offices, you know, oh, maybe I should wear a t-shirt and uh, top up my tan before the summer. You know, you can just see it happening all around the city. And, and, but it's March, and actually next week we could have an absolutely freezing cold day, and then the people in t-shirts thinking, why have I worn a t-shirt? You kind of get this foretaste of summer, but it's not yet summer. And when someone's healed, when Jean Smith is healed of her blindness, that's a foretaste. What it tells you is what it's going to be like in the future and that the future is coming. But right now, we don't experience total healing. So what about healing today? If God calls you into the medical profession, that's a great calling. Hospitals, actually, if you look at the roots of hospitals, it goes back to Christian institutions, which were set up on the belief that people matter to God because they're made in God's image. And actually, historically, his hospitals were uh, founded by Christian orders and funded by Christian donors. And I'm actually so thankful for the medical profession. Uh, when I was uh, 16, I became uh, quite seriously ill. I started off with a chest infection. I didn't stop. I kept on going, played lots of sport. I was swimming uh, for Luton Swimming Club. Um, it's actually a mark of some distinction, but um, <laughs> no one seems that impressed. And, uh, and, and, um, and, and I never stopped. I just carried on training. I did all that sort of stuff. And, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And then eventually I got pleurisy. And they gave me some medication for that. But it didn't make me better. It actually made me worse. I went downhill very quickly. And after a couple of days, I was rushed into hospital in an ambulance. And I still remember being in an accident emergency with my poor mother. And just looking her in the eyes and saying, I think I'm going to die. And then I collapsed on the floor. And my mum was kind of looking at me, kind of running around, screaming in A&E. Poor mum. And, uh, <laughs> but, 
It turned out I'd had an allergic reaction to the drugs, and it caused something called Stephen Johnson syndrome. And I'll spare you the gory details. It's quite a, a nasty condition. And the situation was going downhill quite fast, and it was only because there was a brilliant consultant at the hospital. And she had seen this condition once or twice before in her career, and she was able to diagnose it straight away when she saw it. And at the same time, out of desperation really, my parents had contacted the church and asked someone to come and pray for me. And I was kind of drifting in and out of consciousness in hospital and just aware of um, someone praying for me. And I wasn't healed instantly, although I did think it had an impact. But what I felt actually when that person was praying for me was such a sense of God drawing close to me. I felt like he was holding me all the time I was in hospital. Uh, And it was a a painful few weeks. But as the treatment started to kick in, I I, I eventually got back on my feet. And I have to say, I am so thankful for that brilliant consultant who saved me, actually. And there's a sense in which all healing ultimately comes from God. The consultant was using her brilliant God-given skills. And then there was the natural God-given healing processes of my body which kicked into action. Uh, So sometimes God heals people explicably through the medical profession, but sometimes he seems to heal people inexplicably and directly, so we shouldn't stop praying. And actually, just just under 20 20, 20 months ago, um, at our 9.30 service here on a Sunday morning, uh, a husband and wife came up to me just by that pillar there, just on that little patch of delightful patch of grey carpet just there in front of that pillar, very fond of that spot. And uh, the the husband said that he'd suffered a brain hemorrhage. And one of the consequences was that that he had actually lost sight in his left eye. And they were understandably deeply concerned about this. And the surgeons had, had operated to try and, operated on his brain to try and relieve pressure on the eye, but it hadn't been successful and it hadn't improved. And they asked me, Uh, This is early on a Sunday morning. They asked me to pray that sight would be restored in that eye. Now, that seemed to me to be a pretty big ask. And my temptation was to kind of try and hedge my bets a little bit and pray nice and good and, to be honest, pretty vague prayers about them, you know, feeling peace and uh, feeling comforted at this difficult time um, and that the surgeons would be wise. Uh, And I did pray for those things. It's good to pray for those things. But actually, the first thing I prayed for was what they'd asked me to pray. And so very simply, not very well, I just asked that God would heal his eye and restore his sight. And if I'm honest, in the, in the coming days, all the busyness of life, I forgot all about it. And then two weeks later, on Sunday, the 7th of June, 20 months ago, uh, at the end of the uh, 9.30 service, they came up to me again. And he said, you know, quite matter of fact, actually, he just came up and he said, thank you so much for praying for me uh, two weeks ago. And I was like, no, no problem, it's, it's kind of what I do. And... Uh, <laughs> They, they said, like, he said, he's, and then he just kind of said quite nonchalantly, he said, oh, I just wanted to let you know that I went, we went to the hospital on Tuesday and the doctors have told me um, that the sight's actually been restored in my left eye, um, you know, up to 98%. And, and I, I said, oh, that's great, that's great. And I started walking, I thought, what did he just say? And I, I kind of came back and I said, so sorry, I, I think I missed her. What did you say? He said, oh, they said my sight's been restored 98%. And I was like, oh. And he, I mean, I, I think actually probably he knew it had been restored 98. I mean, I don't think he needed them to tell him that his sight had been restored 98. But maybe the precise percentage he needed them to tell him. And, uh, and I said, well, that's, that's great. And he said, yeah. And I, to be honest, it took me about an hour to process it. I think, did he really, it actually happen? That's amazing. And uh, I, I think I was just shocked. And I think actually he was quite shocked as well. Because, I mean, I had prayed the prayer. That's what I'd prayed. But I didn't think I'd done it very well. I didn't think I'd done it with much confidence. And so it was a bit of a surprise to me that something actually happened. Now, that wasn't some kind of auto-suggestion. It wasn't the power of positive thinking. He had lost the sight in that eye, and now he could see out of that eye. It was a substantial and swift transformation of health. And obviously, the medical profession played a part, but it seems that prayer did too. Now, of course, I've prayed for lots of people who haven't been healed. And that's difficult. You know, people I care about, people I love, people I would desperately want to be healed. And that leaves me with lots of questions. But it doesn't stop me praying. 
as John Wimber used to say, uh, when we prayed for no one, no one was healed. Now we pray for everyone and some people are healed. So how in practice do we go about praying? Well, of course, it's God who heals and not us. No one has healing up their sleeves. Uh, There's no need for hype or shouting. There's no special technique involved. Jesus always prayed with love. He had compassion. That was his motive, and that should be our motive. So we don't put burdens on people. We never say, oh, it's your fault. You don't have enough faith if someone's not healed. Uh, you, you You don't... suggest, you never suggest that that God doesn't love them or loves them less in some way because they're not healed. Obviously, that's not the case. So we pray with love. And we've actually found that words of knowledge, these gifts of the Spirit, they're actually really helpful. Sometimes it's a picture, an impression. uh, And we'll do this later on this evening. We believe God will give to people uh, words of knowledge, pictures, impressions, maybe a sympathy pain. And I've watched this happen. This is such a fun evening on Alpha. We've so, seen so many uh, amazing things, actually, God acting in wonderful ways. And uh, actually, a, a young woman here tonight who's given me permission to share this, Sarah Jones, who's just there in a white, helpfully white jumper. Sorry, just give away there, Sarah. And uh, Sarah was actually, uh, she's hosting on a group this term, but actually, she was an Alpha guest 22 months ago. And she came on Alpha as a guest. And again, Sarah's given me permission to say this. She came because she was looking for hope, really. And Sarah thought, Alpha was okay, uh, but things hadn't really fallen into place with her. And actually, Sarah had been suffering for years with terrible recurrent migraines. Uh, The same as her mum, the same as her nan. And they would happen about twice a month, and they would last for a day at a time. And they were caused by uh, light sensitivity, photo sensitivity, and there'd be a huge pain uh, in the right side of the head and numbness on the whole left side. And the day of this talk, it would be incapacitating, like she'd, she'd slur her words, she'd just be, she'd have to go home from work. It would have a terrible impact on days she had a migraine. On the day of this talk, she was watching uh, Wimbledon out in the city uh, in, in front of one of those big screens, and it was a sunny day, and probably because of the, the light, the, the migraine started. And she had to go to first aid at her work, and she was sent home to bed and almost didn't come to Alpha because she just felt so terrible. But she kind of woke up and she thought, okay, I'll drag myself in, still feeling awful. And actually that night, someone had a word of knowledge that there was someone here with a migraine. And it was a pain in the right side of the head with light sensitivity. And that was exactly where Sarah's uh, pain was. So when she went down to the small group, she she just said, "I, I think that might have been me. And the group prayed for her. Very simple prayer. And the pain stopped that night. And actually, Sarah hasn't had a migraine since. Not one in the last 22 months. And that for Sarah was the moment when she thought, this is it. And obviously, the healing is remarkable. And it's made such a difference to Sarah's life. But the bit she's most thankful for is that it made her realize that God actually knows her and loves her. And it's always a bit of a risk. Someone said faith is spelled R-I-S-K. It's a risk giving out words of knowledge, and it's a risk responding to them. I know. I can be a bit reserved. I find it a bit nerve-wracking. I find it it makes me feel vulnerable giving out a word, or even responding to one. I find that uh, makes me feel vulnerable as well. And I have to push myself to give words, and I have to push myself to respond to them. But when I hear stories like Sarah's, I think this is worth the risk. I want to encourage you to keep going, keep praying. We have a very simple model. We, we just say, you know, just maybe lay a hand on someone's shoulder as you pray for them. We ask the Holy Spirit to come. And one of the things we've found is that you might need to pray more than once. Uh, there's, there's an incident recorded in the accounts of Jesus' life in the Gospels where Jesus prayed for a man uh, who was blind. And he laid hands on him. And he said, how are you doing? And the man said, well, I can see I can see, but it looks like trees walking. So once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. And this time, his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. 
So don't give up. Even if you're not healed, prayer is a blessing. And I'm sure that something always happens. Sometimes it's it's really obvious, like with Sarah, and sometimes it's not so obvious, but it's always a blessing. Not only for the person. I found it's actually a blessing to be prayed for, and it's actually a blessing to pray for someone else. It actually is a blessing for me to take a risk and ask God to heal someone. It kind of builds my faith. And so my encouragement to you is to try and be a person who brings healing wherever you go, in your family, in your workplace, in your community, in your university. Be someone who prays for the sick, who binds up the brokenhearted, who wipes away people's tears, who lifts up the fallen, who brings healing where there is division. Be someone who brings healing wherever you go. Thank you for listening. Thank you.